wherever you're watching us and welcome to the last installment or rather the remaining the remaining part of our voyage to love island and even as we begin we just want to say welcome to service uh, invite someone into the service take out your phone hit someone tell them welcome to service we have something amazing for you and even as we begin with this time of uh, of worship in song uh, get up onto your feet get up onto your feet and let us enjoy this journey so we are going to go through a transitional journey slowly and effortlessly for you to enjoy what the Lord has done throughout this month are you ready guys yeah you're ready so let us begin. I'd like you to just walk. Very nice. I can see you. I can see you at home. Very nice. I love it.
Lion of Judah Abu Gejima Yeshua Yeshua Even as we are gathered here, we want to put you in your rightful place. Just speak to him. Speak to him in your own way. Be comfortable to speak to your father. Because he is listening. to win it 
not the destination but it is the journey that molds us so Lord we are here to experience what your journey has in store for us it's your will above us so Lord we give all that we have we give it all over to you and say that since you are Yahweh you know what we need you will provide us as you provided for the children of Israel you will heal, Lord. You've done it before. You have dried seas, waters, rivers for, for us, Lord. So, Lord, we are here. We are here in all of who you are. And we love it, Lord. We lift up your name and we say, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. You deserve it. And all the saints said, Amen. And all the saints said, Amen. Welcome to service. Yes. And as our captain is taking us through this final voyage, guys, reach out to someone, tell them, Welcome to service. Yes. We love you guys. Till next time. Wow, wow, wow. Welcome to church. It's so great to see you this morning. My name is Pastor M. Moravi Wanjao, Senior Pastor of Mavuno Church. And I'm so glad to see every one of you from wherever you're watching in the world. You're so, so welcome. We're a family of churches scattered across the world. And uh, I, I, every time I'm always amazed at who comes to worship with us every Sunday, who's part of this family. We're so grateful you're here. If you're a visitor, it's your first time. This is Mavuno Church. We're a family of real people with real issues before a real God. And we exist to turn ordinary people into fearless influencers of society and we're glad that you're here with us so hey uh, i want to just there's a link on your screen right now it's called mavuno at home we want to know where you're watching from where you're worshiping from so please if you can just fill that out right now it allows us to have a way to know how to pray for you how to care for you uh especially for those of you who are watching from home that you're part of our online congregation so if you could just take a moment it would take you it just takes a couple of uh, moments uh, even as i speak just fill that out and let us know what's happening for you who's watching with you and even how we can pray for you. Uh, hey, uh, and as we do that, I just want to say um, this coming week we're starting uh, an amazing new series. I know we've had fun with Love Island. I mean, it's been so exciting connecting with every one of you. Today we're going to be finishing uh, the Love Island series. I'm glad you're in church today. It's going to, today's word, let me just tell you, um, you'll be happy you're in church. <laughs> it's a great word. Uh, but you know what? Uh, this coming month is going to be even more amazing. Because we have an incredible series and it's called Behind the Scenes When God Goes Silent. And I don't know if you've ever found yourself in that position where it's like, hey, I mean, I thought we had a thing going with God. I was in an upper creek somewhere. I was in trouble somewhere and God just did not come through. In fact, God's voice went silent. And maybe some of you are even in that place right now. Hey, there's hope. Uh, there's such a powerful word that's going to be coming to us this coming month. So hey, invite your friends. Uh, let's, let's, let's come together and just learn about how to operate in that space when God goes silent. And uh, I really believe it's going to be a liberating and healing series uh, for many people. Bring your family, friends, bring your people from, from the office, because all of us go through that season in life when things are just not holding together. And hey, uh, as we do that, I want to just uh, again um, pray for us. Uh, one of the things that God has been challenging us about this year is about giving our first fruits in addition to our tithes and our offerings. A, a, a first fruit is a, a, a risky thing to give because it's an equivalent of one month of your income. 
and we challenge people at Mavuno Church every, uh, every year. This is a, th- a thing that's part of our culture is that we give towards that. We don't do uh, like big fundraising campaigns or anything. We just give uh, our tithes regularly. Uh, which is how we run the operations of the church. And then we give our fast fruit, which is an equivalent of one month's income. We give that at the beginning of the year. And it, it allows us to get into capital expansion, to build churches, to, be, to build worship centers where people can worship God, to expand the kingdom and the gospel of Jesus. And so we want to challenge you, if you're a member, to, to give towards this. I was, I was, as, I, as I pray, there's a scripture that I was reading uh, this morning that really struck me. And, and it, it's in Genesis chapter 4. And it's the first instance when we come across this whole concept of fast fruits, I believe. Uh, and it's in verse 3, it says, In the course of time, these are, there are two brothers at this point, the first two brothers in the world. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. So Cain comes with his offering. And Abel, his brother, also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And here it says a very interesting thing. It says, The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. I mean, this is a, it's a very puzzling passage. It's like two people coming to worship God, people bringing offerings and gifts to God. But on one, he's so favorable. The other, he's not. And you ask, what's the difference? And you know, the passage tells us Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil. Uh, so he brought some of the things he had to give God. But it tells us Cain brought fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. Cain gave the best and the first to God. And as a result, God looked at him with favor. And, and by the way, I, I don't look at this passage as saying that when I don't give my first fruit, that I don't get favor from God. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that there's precedent for us to understand that even in scripture, people gave their first fruit and that there was anointing and blessing that came upon their life as a result. And I want to just uh, pray for us because I know many of us are taking that step. If you haven't yet, you can actually go on our website. Uh, you'll see a picture of fruit and it says first fruits. Click on that. Make your first fruit pledge. And let's just begin this exciting journey of faith. I really believe that this is going to be a year of breakthrough and influence, uh, of rapid acceleration with ease as we take God at his word and as we come before him with our first fruits. And so let me pray for us as we give and as we prepare for God's word. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for your children. Thank you for the privilege of being among your people, people called by your name to represent you on planet earth. Thank you that everything we have belongs to you and we are stewards. We're really just uh, your stewards of it. We're your managers of the resources that you give us. And I pray that, Lord, you would continue to bless us with your resources so that we can even represent you better in the way that you allow us to. I pray for your people as they take steps of faith, as they grow in their faith through their giving of their tithes and of their first fruits. And I pray that, Father God, every single one of us, every single person who takes you at your word, every single person who gives, that, Father God, they will have a testimony. They will be able to testify you can never outgive God. Like many already have testified. May they be able to join those who testify and say you can never outgive God. And so, Father God, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for your people. I pray that, Lord, even as we listen to your word, expand our hearts to receive it. And I believe that today the word you have for us is such a powerful word. It has the power to change all our relationships, not just our married relationships. And so, Father, I pray that, Lord, you give us those expectant hearts. And I invite your Holy Spirit to come now and teach us through your word. I pray that, Father God, you give me boldness to speak it. And I pray that your people would receive it well. And that, Lord, it will bring the transformation that you desire. And so I bless you, God's people, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say together, Amen. Amen. Listen up, God, I'm about to let it all out. I am angry and frustrated, and to be honest, I am filled with doubt. I've been praying for answers, but it feels like you are not there. Are you working behind the scenes, God? Do you even care? My finances are a mess, and I'm drowning in debt. I've been praying for a miracle, but it hasn't happened yet. Are you working behind the scenes, God? Can you see my pain or you're too busy that you're okay seeing me suffer in vain? My loved ones are in the hospital and it's taking a toll. I'm praying for healing but it seems like you're ignoring my call. Are you working behind the scenes, God? You know I need a job and a better pay. But it's like all I get is a no and a not today. I've been patient and faithful as you say. But it seems like you're just messing up with my head. Are you working behind the scenes, God? I'm struggling with addiction and it's taking over my life. I am praying for freedom, but it feels like I'm in a constant strife. Are you working behind the scenes, God? Can 
can you break these chains? Or you just watching while my life slowly drains? Are you working behind the scenes, God? My relationships are a mess and it's tearing me apart. I am praying for healing, but it feels like it's just the fourth start. Are you working behind the scenes, God? Can you mend what's been broken? Or you're just watching while my heart is left unspoken? Are you working behind the scenes? God. Dearly beloved, today we are gathered here to celebrate the wonderful union between Philip and Elizabeth. Kindly join me as we celebrate these wonderful love words. We are going to be so happy. We are the perfect couple. Happy anniversary, babe. I'm so glad you chose this restaurant, babe. It's been an amazing year. It sure has. So, here is your anniversary gift, babe. Do people exchange gifts on anniversaries like every single year? I thought marriage is a gift. Did he shamelessly show up without a gift for me? My guy, think quick. I bought you a gift, but delivery delays, but be sure to be amazed. Mm, I have a feeling I know what it is. Because I've been leaving you hints here and there, but I really need to stop doing that. Hints? I don't have a hint of what she's talking about. There's something I've been meaning to, to speak to you about. Mm -hmm. Shucks. I'm sure it's something to do with me and dirty socks. Have you thought about us having a baby? Kids, we just got married 52 weeks ago. We can't wait for Arsenal to lift the trophy fast and talk about kids. Where are her priorities? I think I spoke too soon. He's totally overthinking this right now. Kids, as in plural, oh no, they will take over everything. We'll be outnumbered. So, honey... Bib, I'm ready for us to have a baby sometime in the future. Um, how about you open your gift? This thing looks a little small for me. Does she want to start selling this thing? We're going to have a baby! You're pregnant. We're pregnant. How pregnant are you? Like all the way pregnant, pregnant, pregnant. It's going to be a boy. He's going to be named Martinelli. He's going to go for trials at Arsenal. It's going to be a girl. She's going to be a mini me. She's literally be my handbag. I'll teach him how to build and destroy everything. We'll get our hair and nails done together. Camping trips. Baking. Boarding school. Homeschool. We're going to be the perfect parents. We're going to be so happy. Cheers to us parents to be. Cheers to us, perfect couple and perfect parents to be. Welcome to the final installment of our series, Love Island. Finding the relationship that lasts. Through this series, we've discovered, by the way, as, and if you, I hope you've been cruising with us through this series, and we found out that most people enter romantic relationships excited about the prospects. It always feels like you're on a cruise heading to a romantic island to have the time of your lives. But you know, when the relationship starts to hit those choppy waters that every relationship comes across, many times it stops feeling like a cruise to a romantic island and starts feeling like you're stuck on a desert island. And this happens to every single couple. Why does that happen? It's because we walk into romantic relationships with this invisible box of dreams. And we've been talking about that the last couple of weeks. Our hopes, our desires, our longings, our innocent longings that we hope will make us happy. However, before long, we hand these dreams over to our partner as expectations. And basically what we're saying to them without saying it is, it's your job to make me happy. It's your job to fulfill my expectation. And of course, what happens is the biggest casualty is our gratitude. 
I mean, how do I thank somebody who's only doing what is their job to do? So many marriages today are walking around. Many couples are walking around today. Many people who are married are walking around today with no sense of joy or happiness or gratitude. Because it's almost like, my goodness, I mean, this is your job. When you do something good for me, it's your job to do it. I expect it anyway. And that's why we learned that we must develop an attitude of gratitude in our relationships. Uh, we must learn to say thank you. We must learn to look for things to thank. And we must also do things for one another without expecting anything in return. Now, we also went into that place where we, how do we unlock the deadlock that happens, the expectation deadlock that happens in our relationships. And we talked about the principle of mutual submission. Basically, God designed our marriages to be a model that demonstrates God's love to a watching world. And by prioritizing their wives above themselves, their wives' needs above themselves, putting their wives first, dying to their wives, then husbands are showing the world how radical God's love is. And by submitting to their husbands, then wives are demonstrating how the church is meant to submit to God. And finally, last week, we talked about how when our needs are not met, a box of expectations often turns to a box of frustrations. But instead of throwing the box at one another, God wants us to throw the box at him. That God wants us to bring our, our, our frustrations to him, to report our partners to him, to bring all our raw and filtered anger, whatever it is that we're facing, bring it to God because he's able to handle it and he's able to work in our hearts, but also change the hearts of our spouse or our partner. Now today we want to close this series by talking about an incredibly important choice, possibly the most important choice every couple will ever have to make in, the, in, in their relationship. And I said this series, if you're married, I mean this one is worth the price of admission. <laughs> this last one is going to be it. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're in the right place to hear this. If you're, if you're single and dating, oh my goodness, I'm so glad you get to be prepared for this even before you jump into this journey. If you're not yet married, uh, or maybe you're even divorced right now or, or separated, uh, maybe you're widowed, uh, you know what? I really do believe that God wants every single one of us to understand how to relate in a godly way. And many people have been listening to this series and found freedom in relationships that have nothing to do with marriage or with dating. Uh, freedom in their relationship with their parents, with their children, as they've applied these godly relationship principles to every relationship around them. So this is a relationship for every single one of you. And today I want to share a relationship hack that promises to change your life. Are you ready? Come on, somebody. I mean, this is, you, you need to be ready for this one. I hope you've got your notebook out. Uh, this one, I promise you, is going to be a life-changing one. You see, what happens in every relationship, at some point, a gap will arise between two things. What we expect the person to do for us and what they actually end up doing for us. In other words, there's a gap. And that gap is between our expectations the things that we're expecting. I mean, these are the things I expect you to do for me in a relationship. And my experience, what you actually end up doing for me or to me. And basically, every married couple will always struggle between expectations and experience. Every relating couple, every relationship will have this gap. And depending on how wide the gap is, the frustration increases. So you're going to find many couples where they're going to have these kinds of conversation. You promised you'd always consult. You promised we would always consult between major before any major purchases are made. But you just went and bought something for yourself. You just went and bought a new car. You didn't even consult me. Expectations different from experience. Or, or you said you'd pick up the kids and it was your turn to pick up the kids, but you forgot and the school called me and I had to do it again expectation versus experience or you said you'd be ready by 6 p.m so that we can go out for that important dinner but yet again we are late and i'm sitting in the car wondering what to do with myself because i'm going to be late and embarrassed expectation experience and every time that there's a gap between that expectation what you believe somebody should do and what they actually did we always make a very important choice and most times we don't even understand that we're making a choice. But it's one of the most important choices we'll ever make in our relationship. And this choice, by the way, it affects every relationship. We don't think it's a choice. We think we're merely reacting. But we make this choice. And this is what the choice is called. We assume the worst. We assume the worst. I don't know if this sounds familiar. But basically what happens in relationships is when somebody should have done something and then they didn't do it. They were supposed to be on time and they were not on time. 
you find yourself filling in the gap. And you say things like, my God, I can't believe she did it again. I can't believe he did it again. I mean, this is so typical. That's how he usually is. Why was I expecting anything different from her? I mean, what would have changed? This is exactly what she always does. She always embarrasses me. And you know what we're doing? We don't even realize it, but we're making a choice. We're making a choice at that point. We're assuming the worst. And even though it seems like a normal reaction, we're just disappointed and we're just expressing our disappointment. Basically what happens as we make this choice over and over and over in our relationships, we are inevitably creating an environment of suspicion, of doubt, and of speculation. So what are we supposed to do instead? How are we supposed to respond when we have that gap between expectation and experience? Is there a more godly and productive way to deal with this gap between expectation and experience? I'm going to come to that because today I want us to turn to one of the most famous passages of Scripture, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, often referred to as the love chapter. Chances are you've gone to a wedding when they've read these words to one another, uh, and you've enjoyed listening to love is, love is. It's such a beautiful Scripture. I want to warn us, though, that viewer description is advised when you read this passage. <laughs> uh, because what we often think is a very romantic poem at weddings, it's actually not. It's a very raw and gritty and, and even maybe dark, <laughs> a, 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 a non-romantic description of what true love is. And this could actually mess your, description, your, your, your definition of love. In fact, after this sermon, you may never be able to watch another romantic comedy the same way. Uh, I'm, just wanting, I'm just putting it out there, you know, as you watch this, you need to be sure you're ready. Uh, you may never be able to see a Disney classic the same way. Are you ready? Uh, but be, you, you may not, but you know what? It's going to change your life for the better. And so I want to read this for you, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and it's verse 4 to 8. And here's what it says. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now, this passage is telling us that love is a very deliberate action. An action that has nothing to do with romantic feelings. <laughs> what it describes is three things. It tells us first of all what love is. Love is patient and love is kind. Now, when you're emotionally in love, you don't think about it. I mean, of course you're patient. I mean, you can, she can come late and you're like, oh, she's just so, it's so sweet that she's late today. I don't even understand. It's like you, 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 you just make allowances for the person. You don't have to think about being kind. You buy flowers without even thinking. It's what she likes. It's what makes her happy. But when the inevitable challenges come into your relationship, you will need to develop patience and kindness towards your spouse. You imagine meeting somebody and you ask, how is, how is so-and-so doing? And you say, oh my God, I really need to be patient with her. Nothing romantic about that, is it? It's like you're going to have to actually develop that. This, that's what love is. And then this passage also tells us, not just what love is, it tells us what love is not. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love does not dishonor. Love is not self-seeking. Basically, what he's telling us is that love is not about caring about my own interests. It's about looking up, at, out to the, for the other person's interests above my own. Love is not easily angered. That's what he continues to say. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight. I mean, it's like a whole bunch about things that love is not. The things we think love is, it's actually not these things. In other words, if you love someone, they're going to inevitably offend you. That's what we're learning here. But you need to guard your heart. You can't allow offense to rule your heart. You can't allow yourself to start rejoicing when they're wrong and you're right. You need to leave the past in the past and grant them a fresh start each time. I mean, this, stuff, this is not romantic stuff. This is hard stuff to do. All this is quite radical, right? But then we get to the verse that tells us what love does. So we saw what love is, what love is not, but now we're going to learn what love does. And listen to this. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Now that word, always, I'm sure you agree with me, it kind of raises the bar a little bit, doesn't it? 
It's like, what do you mean always? How realistic is this? I mean, how do you always protect the person who hurts you the most? How do you always trust the person who's let you down the most times? How do you keep hoping even when it doesn't make sense to hope? How do you keep persevering when the most natural thing is to give up and to walk out? Is this even practical? Like we don't see people practicing this around us. Even the people who say that at their wedding, by the way. I mean, these this just feel like nice romantic words we say at a wedding, but not useful in real life. How can we even begin to practice this passage when there's such a huge gap between our expectations and our experience? You see, this passage, it actually gives us the key to what I call the most important decision you will ever make in any relationship. And, in, and, and let me just say, this is going to change your life. This decision is a powerful decision. Because in every relationship, you will experience a gap. A gap between the expectations, the things you expect someone to do, and what you experience, what they do instead. Some of you are dating right now, and you're in love with a person, and you're thinking, poor pastor, we are so sorry for you. Like, I'm so sorry you struggle this way in your relationship, because me, us guys are going to be different. Us, we love each other. You know, and I can't even believe you're having such problems and even preaching such sermons. I want to say this. Listen, a time will come when this someone will be useful to you. I mean, right now it doesn't look like it will be, but ask anyone married and they'll tell you, this is a very relevant someone for you to take notes. Take notes. Uh, <laughs> take notes. Because the time is coming when there will be a major gap for you between your expectations and your experience. And at that point, what you're probably going to end up doing is what everybody else does, is you're going to assume the worst. Because that's what everybody does. But when you assume the worst, you will get the same results in your marriage, in your relationship that everybody around you is getting. And you've noticed what's happening in relationships around you. Relationships are in major trouble because this is what we're doing. We assume the worst. But here's what the Bible is telling us, that there's a radical thing we can do, which is very different. Instead, that we must choose to believe the best. Don't assume the worst. Believe the best. What that means is when your expectations are not met by the person, when they show up late, when they don't do what they say that they would do, that your response needs to be, I don't know why they did this. It was painful. I don't know why she's late again. I don't know why he said such painful words. I don't know why she never followed through. But you know what? I'm sure there's a very good explanation. And one day when I get the full picture, I'm sure it's going to make perfect sense. <laughs> what this is saying is, that to walk the way of love is to daily fill the gap by choosing to believe the best of the other person. Now, I know there's someone who's thinking, come on, pastor, this is seriously messed up. I mean, this just sounds like spiritual mumbo-jumbo. Uh, like, does anyone in the real world think like this? Was the author of this passage even aware of the reality of how people live their lives today? Like how people take advantage of each other. Do they understand the pain that I'm feeling because of my relationship? I can't believe the best of the person. Do they understand how cynical, how evil this other person is? Now I want to just uh, share with you about a book uh, by a man called Marcus Buckingham. Uh, and he wrote, he's a famous author and a business consultant. He wrote this book called One Thing You Need to Know. One Thing You Need to Know. And, and, and this book, it's not about marriage. It's actually about organizational skills and becoming a better leader, becoming a, a better manager, yada, yada. It's, it's that kind of stuff, right? But in this book, he actually cites a marriage study. And he, talk, he looks at a study that was carried out in the US, Canada, and Europe over a 20-year period. It's a pretty exhaustive study. And they studied couples who had gone the distance in their marriage. Couples who, we're not talking about couples who are just surviving or tolerating each other. We're talking about couples who 20 years into their marriage, they were still solidly committed. They loved each other. They were walking together. They were committed to one another. They had intimacy in their relationship. And this study, it's a very secular study, but it was trying to uncover the common denominator that made these marriages work so well. And one of the primary assumptions they had going into the study was that as they were studying these couples who've been married together 20 years plus, that these couples who are successful, they must over time have downgraded their expectations. I mean, the researchers assumed when we find couples who are successful, chances are that it, basically what they did is they, they just lowered their, their bar. And they decided when it comes to the motives, the character, the goodness of the other person, they would say, you know what? I know he's not as great as I thought he would be. She's not as great as I thought she would be. I'm just going to lower my expectations and have a realistic view of my husband or my wife. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, that's what I would have expected going into that study myself. But their study showed the exact opposite. Basically, as part of the study, couples fill out a survey 
both of themselves and of their partner, indicating the score for different areas of their life. And what the researchers found was astonishing. They found that couples who had gone the distance, who were still in love, that they actually rated each other more positively than their partner rated themselves. If the husband, say for instance, gave himself a score of 6 out of 10 in the area of tidiness, how he picks up his socks and how he leaves his room clean and all that stuff, their partner would inevitably rate them higher than the 6 they gave them themselves. And this shocked the researchers because they were finding that these, these people, they actually seem to have an unrealistic positive view of the person they were with. In fact, one of the summations of the study, one of the people who was doing the study said, this study has proved that true love is truly blind. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, how can the successful marriages seem to be the ones where people are blind to their spouse's deficiencies? Like, what a shock. Like, who does that? It's like, why is this? But you know, here's the thing. This study went on to show that when you have an unrealistically positive view of your other person, of your other person, basically what happens is you create an upward spiral of love. So this, 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 this upward spiral, what it basically is, is a positive view, it creates a very strong sense of conviction. When you see that person, when you choose to see them positively, you start having a sense of conviction that this is the right person. It's like, man, okay, fine, they're the right person, I didn't make a mistake. And when you have that sense of, uh, of, of, security, of conviction, it leads you to a sense of security. Because they're the right person, I feel secure in this relationship. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here to stay. And when you have a sense of security, it starts to create what they call a high level of trust. Because I'm here to stay and I've no plans to leave, I'm going to choose to trust that this relationship will work, regardless of what comes at us. And then what does that trust do? It builds intimacy. Because I trust this relationship, I might as well work on getting closer to my partner and understanding them. And that intimacy is what gave them the lasting power to enjoy each other 20 years later. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, the final recommendation this secular study gave was very powerful. It said that when there's a gap between your expectations and your experience, here's what you need to do. Find the most generous explanation for the other person's behavior and begin to believe it. <laughs> I know, I mean, this is not me who wrote this. It's not a pastor who said it. This is a business consultant. And he's talking about business relationship, but he's using marriage as a metaphor for it. In other words, when I don't understand why the person has acted this way that they have, They've not kept their word in a certain area. They've not uh, seemed to be uh, uh, fulfilling what we agreed they would fulfill. It's imperative that for me, the first thing I do is not assume the worst, that my initial reaction must always be, believe the best. Believe the best. Now, let me just say this. Obviously, this is not an easy thing to do. And for obvious reasons. First of all, the person you're with may have let you down over and over and over. And I'm talking to somebody right now, you're thinking, this is impossible. Look at how many times they've hurt me. They're just consistently doing the wrong thing. But secondly, and even more critically, is the fact of who I am. That none of us enters relationships as a blank slate. We all show up with our own past wounds, our baggage, our insecurities from previous relationships. And as a result, there are certain behaviors that our spouse has or our partner has that trigger certain responses in us. I mean, we can't help it. I came in with my baggage. But here's the thing I want you to hear, that even with all the inconsistency your partner brings, and even with all the baggage that you brought, the junk from your past that you bring into the relationship, it is still a choice every single time. You still make a choice. It's not an, a reaction, it's a choice. And every time you encounter that gap between expectation and experience, you have to make a choice. And the choice that you make, assume the worst, believe the best, that choice will inevitably impact how your relationship will go forward from that point on. Now, it's always easier to assume the worst. It's always easier to assume the worst. But the problem is that your relationship will always end up with suspicion. So here's what happens. The negative, the, the, the opposite thing happens. I assume the worst, it brings suspicion. And suspicion is when you start asking, why did they act so badly? What else are they hiding from me? Like what kind of thing would make someone do this to me? That's suspicion. And the problem with suspicion that makes it so, so dangerous is that if you assume the worst over and over, guess what happens? You eventually will find something to be suspicious about. I mean, you'll end up dealing with what psychologists call confirmation bias. 
And this is a tendency to interpret all new evidence as confirmation of what you actually believed. <laughs> you're ready, you, it's like anything that happens now, it starts to prove what you are believing. And because, basically what that means is you start processing everything they do with only one goal, to confirm that you are already right in what you are thinking. And that's so dangerous from your relationship because what does it breed? It breeds what is called mistrust, a culture of mistrust in your relationship. And when you have that relationship, when you're, by the way, if you're in a relationship with someone who doesn't trust you, it's like you're living your life on pins and needles all the time because you know they are looking for something for you, for you to do wrong. It's always like you're even apologizing before you do something because they're going to just, you're just on the wrong. You feel like you're off balance. You're extremely cautious. You're walking on eggshells all the time. You're never happy in that kind of situation. Mistrust will breed this kind of place, uh, kind of space. And here's the craziest thing mistrust does. With mistrust, you may actually find yourself accidentally creating the environment for the very thing that sets up the other person to do the thing you feared the most. The thing they had no intention of doing in the first place. And that's because mistrust in a relationship is always a self-fulfilling prophecy. It sets a stage for the very thing you fear will happen. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. It's very easy to, to focus on the other person, what they did, what they didn't do. Uh, and, and I'm not saying there's not a place for that, but often it must start with you. Because when you start having that mistrust, you end up into that place of self-fulfilling prophecy and you say, look, he even left me. I knew from the first day he was going to leave me. You have no clue. And by the way, I, I'm, I kid you not, I've, been, I've, I've actually canceled people in this kind of situation where through their self-fulfilling prophecy, when they walked into the marriage, they knew the guy would cheat. And basically you worked through this whole spiral until the day that inevitably you pushed to the place where this person actually had an affair and you said, I knew it. And you had no idea that your mistrust, your whole cycle, the negative cycle of mistrust resulted in the very thing you feared the most. Now, let me just say this. And I don't want anyone to get this wrong. If you're in a place where it's abuse, especially physical abuse, uh, you need to get away from that space. If you're in a, one of our churches, you're listening to this and you're in a place of abuse, uh, uh, you, I'm not saying stay in that place. You need to flee. You need to get help. And you need to get a counselor to walk with you, a pastor to walk with you, to help you to be able to start renegotiating what kind of relationship you can get into. You, you, you can't deal with it by yourself. So that one, don't try. Like, get help. Uh, you may also be in a situation where things are just happening over and over, the same, same thing, over and over. And it's a cycle of addiction. And again, in that place, you might need to get external help. But here's the thing. Once the conversation has been had, once you've begun to, you've, it's being dealt with, again, you have a choice. And happily married couples are not happily married because they have no issues. Can I tell you a secret? It's, it's a truth. Happily married couples, they look very happy, but let me tell you, it's not because they have no issues. There's no couple I've ever met who has no issues. Uh, happily married couples are happily married because despite their issues, they've made the hard choice. They've decided to believe the best about the other person. So what are you going to choose today? Are you going to choose to assume the worst of your spouse? Or will you make a commitment today to believe the best? You see this truth, it may not just save your marriage. It might be the thing that catalyzes you into that one thing you desire, that relationship you've always wanted. As you enter into that positive upward spiral where you choose to believe the best of your partner. Now, as I conclude, I want to just remind you, I mean, let me just say, by the way, what I've taught you right now, this could be the thing that saves your marriage. And for us, I can tell you, this saved our marriage. Come to Family Night. We're going to be talking about this and, uh, uh, this Wednesday and 5.30. And like I said, we share real, we're raw at that place. And we just talk about real ex uh, experiences. And Kara and I have many ex examples of how choosing to believe the best changed our marriage. But as I conclude, I also want to remind you of an amazing event coming up uh, March 16th to 18th. Like seriously, if you're a part of this church and you're a couple, you're engaged or, or you're married, you can't miss that event. It's the Ndoa Festival, March 16th to 18th. And the theme is Rekindle the Fire. Come on, somebody. Uh, we're going to be rekindling the fire because the world is always pouring water on your fire. It's always trying to douse your fire. We're going to be rekindling the fire. Thursday is going to be a couples conference. It's for pastors and couples in ministry. If you know any pastor friends, anybody who's in ministry serving together, call them to come into this space or one of them is in ministry. Call them to come because we really do believe that there's a special place to care for those couples uh, uh, in, 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 and we're going to create an environment for that. Friday night is a gala dinner. And that one is, is, is entitled Keeping It Hot. 
<laughs> uh, sustaining intimacy among diapers and deadlines. I mean, like, seriously, you want to come to that one. Uh, you you want to make sure you're there. It's going to be a fantastic dinner. And then, so bring your plus one. Bring them and make sure they're there for that. And then Saturday is a whole day's couple conference. And I want to just encourage you, if you're a couple, make sure, at least be there for Friday and Saturday. Like, plan to be there for both of them. Uh, and, and the total price is only 7,000 shillings. I'm, I'm, I mean, this is a great investment in your marriage. Check it out on our website, www.mavunochurch.org. Reserve your space early. Invite your friends who are married or engaged. And let's begin to build the relationships the way God wants them. I pray this series has been uh, useful to you. Whether you're married or not, I pray that this has given you some insights of things you can begin to practice in all your relationships. And I want to just pray for us as we go into this next week. Father, thank you. Thank you for your people. And Lord, I thank you that in this church we keep it real. I thank you for allowing us to just be a warm family of people who talk about real things, real issues, because none of us have our act together. Every one of us understand we are on a journey, a pilgrimage to become better and better, to know you better and better, to serve you better and better. And Lord, I just want to pray for somebody who's in this space, who's been choosing to fill the gap in their relationship with that spiral of distrust. In fact, I pray for somebody who did that already and because as a result, they can see that their marriage broke. Uh, Lord, one of the things that you've been giving me as a word for this church is that this will be a year when separated marriages will come back together. Uh, this will be a year when even some divorced couples will find each other again. And Lord, we're, I'm trusting you right now. I'm praying for reconciliation uh, among the couples of this church. I pray for reconciliation among everybody who's watching uh, this, this today. Uh, Lord, I also want to pray uh, for those who are in that place where their understanding, a new understanding is coming into their way. And Lord, they are going to choose after this that I will make a decision, that I will believe the best. I'm going to choose to find the best explanation. I'm going to choose to be an optimist about other people. I'm going to choose to even have a, even if it's, an, I'm just going to choose to believe better about them. And Father, I pray that even as we do this, empower us with your Holy Spirit. And Father, my prayer is that the relationships of, in this church will be of such a quality that people will walk in and they will say, oh my goodness, the the way people love each other here, there must be a God. That our relationships, will actually, our relationships will actually attract people to you. And so, Father, I bless your church now. Ah, come on, I speak over you, God's people. Your relationships are blessed. Your children are blessed. Your careers are blessed. Ah, you are blessed as you come in and blessed as you go out. Ah, may the Lord just protect you, hem you in before, behind and before. May 2023 be that year when you, as a person who knows God, you will be great and you will do great exploits for him. And I bless you in this way, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together. Amen. Amen. Amen.